our next speaker has uh, also a relationship to the maker movement, but what has she not a relationship to? She uh, has been described as one of the best connected museum professionals in Europe with the bridge to the American continent. This is a very serious networker indeed. Uh, what she is passionate about is bringing people together, sharing experiences, creating new things, widen each other's horizons, and discover new and better ways of doing things. She is engaged in numerous networks like ICOM or the International Council of Training Personnel. She is a member of uh, the Children Museum Award Jury, but her most recent project was the coordination of a network called the Learning Museum. It features not less than 85 members from 25 European countries, but also the US and Argentina. And I'm sure she will touch upon what they are doing, because learning is really a, a field where she is hanging out all the time. Her name is uh, Margarita Sani. Welcome. Yeah, there you are. This one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It works. Uh, I'm very happy and, and honored to be here and to share my experience uh, of the last years with you. As Pernilla pointed out, I, I identify myself as a networker mainly. So um, when thinking of the ways in which I could contribute to, to today's work, I thought uh, I, what I could do best would be to report on the experiences and the learning activities I've witnessed in museums over the last 10, 15 years. This because I myself am not a, a museum educator or a museum professional in the sense that I don't work in a museum, but I work for museums at the Institute of Cultural Heritage of the region Emilia-Romagna in Italy. Um, and uh, in that uh, capacity, I uh, coordinated, uh, um, I designed and coordinated several European projects uh, on uh, learning in museums, on museum education, lifelong learning, uh, intercultural dialogue, volunteering, cultural volunteering, and so on. Um, and and so I would like to report on the experiences and activities I've, I've seen. Um, as Pernilla mentioned, this the Learning Museum project was... Uh, hello, I see a, a familiar face now here. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Learning Museum project was uh, the last uh, network which I coordinated, and um, there are lots of materials on the website which is still active, although at the moment we are passing it over to another network, which is NIMO, the Network of European Museum Organizations. And in fact, in Bologna, uh, in November, we will have the first kickoff meeting of the Learning Museum project as a working group within NIMO. So the work continues, although the Euro European funding uh, is over. And we intend to uh, keep those ties and the liaisons and working uh, collaborations um, in, intact and, and, and working. So when thinking of how I could uh, report on, on all these different experiences I've been witnessing over the years, I thought I would do it by uh, choosing two leading strands. One is audiences and one is outcomes. So uh, which audiences does the museum engage with and which outcomes and learning outcomes are there to be seen. Apart from what we would generally agree is uh, a learning outcome of learning about facts knowledge and uh, being more aware of the heritage uh, around us. And in fact, um, when, I, when I did that, uh, I, I soon understood that there are so many different uh, learning uh, and learning outcomes in, in all the activities that uh, this brought me to, to give to my presentation the title of what learning, which is in fact uh, the, the question that I would like to pose to you. What learning happens in a museum and who is learning also is the, is the question next to that. So uh, by following my, my leading thread of looking at audiences and outcomes, I would like to start with the most, uh, uh, say, uh, usual or, or common one that one could think of, that of children and school children. Now, 
one would say, uh, in fact, when we started many years ago uh, researching lifelong learning in museums, it was obvious that the most frequent audience of museums would be school children. And, um, but the interesting thing is that uh, the outcomes are not only uh, facts and knowledge and an integration of the school curriculum, but can be, can be many different things. And in fact, I would like to mention here one uh, project that we have been funding over several years now in Emilia-Romagna, which is a competition called I Love Cultural Heritage, where, um, children, uh, where, where schools and uh, museums have to work together to develop uh, a project. And uh, the, the point is, that uh, the competencies that are acquired or that the competition wants these joint projects to acquire are the transversal competencies that uh, the European Union has identified some years ago. So the learning here, the outcome, is not or not only learning about facts or about the heritage, but it's also learning maybe to learn or learning to be more entrepreneurial or uh, learning uh, digital competencies and so on. So uh, the outcomes of these projects uh, were in fact many different uh, objects and uh, such as uh, catalogues, exhibitions uh, and so on. And uh, in general, an appreciation of the heritage and uh, uh, what is called now active citizenship, so being aware of, of the heritage and wanting to, to stand up for it and, and to protect it, but also uh, these transversal competencies that I was mentioning. So, a learning outcome which is maybe not so usual. Um, with adults, now I, I wanted here to, to uh, remind ourselves of, of a couple of, uh, so to say, historical projects with adults, one of which happened in Stockholm uh, several years ago, was called Stockholm Education, and it started out uh, by wanting to uh, um, help museum workers in the city, so policemen, uh, policemen um, taxi drivers, everyone working in the infrastructure of the city to be more aware of the city itself, so to learn about the city. And uh, it was led with um, guided visits in the city, but also um, also with work at the uh, Stockholm City Museum, looking at maps, at the archival material and so on, to make people more aware of their surroundings. So ultimately, to give as an outcome not, so, not only the, 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 the knowledge, a better knowledge of the city, but also uh, a sense of their work as something important, as something that happens in, in a special environment and so on. Um, so again, an, a, 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 an outcome which does not only have to do with learning of something, but maybe learning about yourself and feeling better as a person these needs that, that John was, was mentioning. And another one, another example from Chiasma in Helsinki, uh, working with corporate groups who go to the museum uh, maybe to have a good time or, to, or for activities of team building. Again, an objective which is quite different from that of wanting to learn about the history or about contemporary or modern art. And uh, recently, um, this is a, a project in which I will be involved as a partner and which will start in the next months, has just been funded and led, will be led by a, a French organization, Cape, uh, Cap Science, uh, called the Creative Museum, uh, which, will have, uh, which has the objective of bringing together uh, museum uh, people, museums, and the, these communities of do-it-yourself makers and so on, to uh, improve uh, the creativity of museum uh, professionals, to work with audiences, to create something new, to do something innovative, and, and therefore, uh, enter into a relationship with these new movements, which again will lead to very uh, different and new activities. So in general, the outcomes or the learning outcomes when you deal with adults uh, are also, uh, apart from these which I was mentioning as normal and usual heritage awareness, are more in, in the line of life skills, professional skills, creativity, enjoyment, uh, socializing, 
And also, there are learning outcomes uh, on the side of the museum professionals leading these activities, especially with adults, uh, which, uh, which uh, lead the museum to open up to new partners, to new organizations, and also to learn something, as, because as we were uh, reminded just before, uh, people come into the museum with prior knowledge, prior experiences, and these all adds on to the learning experience which happens there. Also, uh, adults with difficulties can be another uh, area. And I would like here to mention uh, the In Touch project, which was uh, conducted in the UK, the Manchester Museum, and uh, uh, other museums in the north of, of England, uh, which brought together a group of 180 people with difficulties in, of various kinds, uh, single parents, refugees, uh, unemployed, long unemployed people and so on, with the objective of uh, training them and giving them uh, a cultural heritage uh, course with basic skills uh, included in this course. So they, uh, they were, and, and also with the ultimate objective of maybe gaining them as volunteers for the museum in this way also contributing to widen the workforce of the museum to uh, be more representative of the community. So, uh, again, uh, the, the, these uh, were 10-week-long uh, courses uh, in which people learned about the heritage, about the museum, but they also learned how to write a CV, and they also learned to be more, more self-confident, to sort of like get out maybe of an isolated situation. And uh, so again, very, very different and additional outcomes or learning outcomes than what you would expect in a learning environment such as the museum. And in this case, there was a very, very good um, outcome of uh, uh, retention rate of people who went back uh, to learning in a formal context and also some people, many of them volunteers, 85% uh, of the participants, and 18% even found a job, although this was not an objective of the, as such of the initiative. Then, of course, there is the other audience of, uh, shall we call them new citizens or migrants, which open up a, a, a completely new uh, agenda uh, for the museum. I would like to mention here a, a project in, in Emilia-Romagna, in Modena, which was part of uh, one of our uh, European-funded uh, projects called Map for ID. And um, this one, uh, called Choose the Peace, uh, wanted to introduce the new citizens uh, of Modena to the history of the city. So there was an introduction, this is an archaeological museum, an introduction to the museum and to the most important 20, 30 objects which actually represent the, the development of the city in ancient times. And the participants were given the opportunity to actually choose and handle the, the objects uh, that they felt would represent themselves best, that they chose, and for which they became sort of like uh, tutors, and in fact you see the, the, the picture of the award ceremonies in which they were given certificates for taking care and disseminating information uh, about this object they chose. All of this ended up in a, in a diary, um, in a diary which would portray uh, the participants, the chosen object, and again it makes us, uh, the, the the museum then continued over the years to carry out similar activities and every other year they would produce an agenda on different subjects. Um, and again, here we, we, are, we are looking at different outcomes of uh, giving participants tools to, to uh, better understand the co new context in which they live. Again, uh, a feeling of being welcomed by cultural institutions in the city, but also lots of learning outcomes on the side of the museum professionals who, uh, first of all, had to look for that audience that they did not know and go out and actually find out how to make connections. And then it has become, in this sense, uh, in this case, a very, very fruitful uh, project which was was really built into the fabric of the museum and has become a permanent activity of, of that museum. 
older people is also uh, an important audience, and increasingly so as our continent becomes older and older. And here I would like to mention, uh, first of all, one of the reports that our Learning Museum project um, produced. We produced eight, which are all on the website and downloadable. And this one was uh, led, this, this working group, research group, was led by the uh, Jamtli Museum in, in Ostersund. Um, a couple, so, and, and, and you will find uh, several examples and case studies there. Um, one project in Rome, which I would like to mention, is called Memory of Beauty, and has, uh, involves um, people with Alzheimer and their caretakers. And again, uh, the, the outcomes in this case are or in general for older people, uh, creativity, and also older people are, are involved in curating exhibitions, doing art activities. Where the subject of what they got out of these activities has been researched, the outcome is that uh, people feel uh, better and also, um, in some cases, declare that they feel they have a longer life expectancy, which is an amazing uh, outcome nothing to do with learning or you know but so it's it's very important to reflect on all the 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 the, the consequences there can be uh, of of a learning experience which we offer as such in the museum but uh, which outcomes can be can be very different and and surprising in some cases in the case of the Rome Gallery of Modern Art, working with Alzheimer people, uh, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease and with their caretakers, has also uh, has been tested, has been carried out in collaboration with the Polyclinic, with the Rome Polyclinic, and uh, has been, of course, assessed um, on both sides of the museum and of the uh, so-called patients, Polyclinic, and also their caretakers. And it ends up being, uh, or, or creating a, a, a better relationship between the caretakers and the patients because they have something that they can maybe talk about and, and, and also has uh, shown benefits on the patients themselves. Then there are some transversal issues that I would like to briefly mention that have to do with learning in a museum. And one is the environment. The environment is very important because many people walk into the door, they are not part of a learning activity, they are individual, uh, individuals visiting, so the, the uh, environment can be inducive to learning, can support learning, depending on how it is uh, conceived, so it has to be comfortable, it has to be engaging, uh, stimulating and so on. Of course, technology plays uh, or can play uh, its part in, uh, um, in stimulating or making it uh, more personalized. And here, uh, this is a, a special, um, say, uh, exhibition at the uh, Gallery of Art, uh, National Gallery of Art in, in Denmark, where they recently um, I don't know whether it's still on, but anyway, uh, they uh, put up an exhibition on freedom. And uh, to put up this exhibition for children, in the children uh, area, they put up an exhibition on freedom uh, by interviewing and working with about 100 children, how they would to prepare it, how they would perceive uh, um, freedom, what freedom is for them, and so on. And so this idea in the drawing and stories came up, this idea, of swings with sounds, which I've not tried out myself, but it was put up, and uh, and um, and so they actually made this area with uh, singing or or sounding swings uh, for children. Um, just to say that the environment itself can really reflect what the wishes of the audiences are. Learning style is another transversal uh, issues, and Pernilla mentioned it very well at the beginning when she. Uh, reminded us of how uh, you know we are all different and, and learning different ways and a lot of work has been done 
in this area, this, this slide shows uh, uh, an exhibition in the Netherlands, in The Hague, uh, or it was uh, rather another city, I don't know. But anyway, uh, where you, at the entrance, you would, this was a university museum, so this was very experimental, uh, you would enter and you would be on the wall, there would be questions that you would answer, quite simple, in fact, I mean, it couldn't go on forever. But at the end of this short questionnaire that you would uh, uh, reply to on the wall, you would be um, given, assigned a, a, a learning style, or say a, a dominant learning style, according to which you would go and follow a specific track in the exhibition. The exhibition at that time, and extensively in the Netherlands, uh, they worked on, the Kolb, on using Kolb learning styles, so the four different um, um, styles of the, the liberator, which are also represented in, in this slide. Uh, the, the liberator, the one who likes uh, con conceptualization and the logical, you know, the timeline following the facts in a very, very uh, clear and logical way. The dreamer who tries to combine practical activities and uh, imagination and uh, the decider and the doer, and I will not go deeply into this, but learning styles are important to favor learning and to really satisfy those needs, which are very, very uh, typical of each individual. Technologies also can, learn, uh, can help a lot in learning in a personalized way. And I will not go deep into this because this is something that maybe we can touch upon later, but certainly the creating online collections or my museum environments online where you can annotate information, where you can um, integrate the virtual and, and, and the physical, where you can visit and then go back uh, to, uh, you know, gaining more information later on. All of this is very important and is certainly an area which will uh, develop, be developed in the future. And finally, uh, this is my last slide, um, acknowledging learning. Um, now, I'm presenting here something that, sh that you might be familiar with in the US. I don't know how much we are familiar with it in, in Europe. Uh, this is the badging system. These uh, are badges, uh, which are uh, representations of achievements, which can happen everywhere. Um, John, maybe we can discuss the, this later, whether it is so widespread in the US. But you, when, uh, your knowledge or your learning is acknowledged through this uh, sort of like visual representation of uh, uh, sort of like a, a badge that you would wear. Uh, but it's digital and it has uh, information attached to it. So um, recently in, in, um, in, in a conference we uh, the subject came up of how museums can, can acknowledge the learning that happens uh, also in a sort of like in informal way and whether people would want to have that, that uh, knowledge uh, acknowledged or that learning acknowledged. And this could be a system uh, which is, uh, has a lot of visual impact, maybe especially among young people because you can you know, put the, the, the badge on, on your uh, Facebook page or whatever. Uh, we decided to use it uh, in uh, the Learning Museum Network at the final, at the end of the three years of work that we uh, carried out together. Uh, so we gave everyone uh, a, a badge of, of Museum Networker with, of course, all the information attached of how that had been obtained and how many hours we had worked and on which subjects and so on. So this is something, again, which could become quite uh, central in the future. So to end, the notion of learning, which is, uh, uh, has become multifaceted in, in the museum environment, has also increasingly been, uh, um, say, uh, at attached to, to concepts such as that of public engagement and participation and uh, audience development, which is very, very central to European uh, programming and, and funding. So it is, uh, as such, uh, talking about learning as we understood it, traditionally can be limiting and we should be looking at all the different learning outcomes uh, as I've tried to show and all the different implications of this uh, learning which happens in the museum. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Marita.
Thank you so much. I have tons of questions, mm. but I'll ask one. <laughs> uh, you are uh, so experienced in the art of collaborating. Mm -hmm. And uh, what have you seen in these collaborations and networks where you have worked on what kind of collaborations that can help us in the museums to ask these questions around learning? Mm. Yeah, well, I think in, in our experience, the, the, the most effective way uh, is that of visiting each other. Mm -hmm. So we, we were able to fund uh, study visits or short uh, working experiences or internship among mm -hmm. museum professionals mm -hmm. going. So the collaboration is much more effective if you have the possibility or the time to go to an organization and spend some time with them, sort of like a, a tutorial or, or a coaching or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, this is the best way to, yeah. to learn. So the, because my, yeah. my immediate answer would have yeah. been, it is the exchange of experiences. Yeah. It is you know, learning from each other's practice that is most important mm. that, we can, uh, that we can. And this is done best when you can actually go to the place and, yeah. and, and see and witness yeah. it yourself. We will, we will, we will uh, arrange that before you leave. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know that a lot of you are already doing it, but we can definitely do it more, much more. And do you have, a, do you have like a, a place or a space or an area that you feel that we should uh, engage with uh, that is outside of our museum sector that we haven't really approached yet or haven't really touched on yet? You were touching on creativity and audience development, and I think you must have seen areas where you think that area is something that we should engage with much more? Um, well, for instance, one, uh, one uh, because we, we, in, in this last project we, we had research, we, we set up research groups and they chose their, their own subject, the subject they wanted to, to research. Mm. So, for instance, one, one, one audience which was not chosen was that of preschools. Mm. I don't think that is a big problem, though in some countries mm. that is done, in others, mm. it, that didn't seem to be uh, a priority. No. Certainly the intercultural dialogue and working with migrants was a priority, mm. working with older people was a priority. Mm. Um, um, so I think that even if preschools was, was something what, that was not considered, it shouldn't be difficult mm. to integrate it. Uh, I see that museums have increasingly opened up to different audiences. So yeah. I could not think yeah. of any yeah. that is, you know, really excluded. Yeah. Uh, but I will be thinking about yeah. it yeah. in the meanwhile, and yeah. if something yeah. comes to mind, yeah. I will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Good, yes. thank you. I just have one, one last question, uh, for now, that is. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you you uh, describe different ways of uh, staging what a museum can be through these projects with different kinds of audiences. Uh, what, what are your, your thoughts around how to uh, ask this question, um, who, who are we, who could we be together with the audience, uh, and still sort of really nurture what it is to be a museum? not transform into a restaurant totally or, or something social yeah. work yes or exactly something like that what are your reflections well, on that well the reflection yeah. is that no matter what you do and no matter what kind of objective you are pursuing say you are pursuing the objective of make, making people feel better mm. okay very well so you work in that direction but nevertheless you're doing it through the collection you're mm. doing it through the objects mm. And, and no matter how virtual you are, you have the real thing. Mm. So that is something that you still, in, in, in some cases, talking to colleagues, they say the object is a pretext. Mm. Maybe it is, but uh, while it is a pretext, it's still there. So yeah. that, that learning and that happens through the object. Yeah. So I think that is something yeah. that you can still hang on yeah. to right and, and through it. which you retain your identity yeah. as a museum professional. Yeah. So. So work, work with it, stick yes. with it. Yeah. Yes, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you soon. Soon. <laughs>